Of all the themes that weave together to create the Dune series, Frank Herbert's portrayal of ecology and environmental issues on a planetary scale is perhaps the singular subject that the novels are most noted for. Although the series is most often identified with the theme of ecology, its predominance within the story diminishes in later books in favour of the treatments of evolution and the destructive hero. Like all good science fiction, Dune is very much a product of its times, reviewing as it does the state of the world's current affairs and extrapolating them forwards to an atavistic society many thousands of years in the future. The early 60s represent a turning point in science fiction, what Thomas D. Clarison refers to as a cul-de-sac, where we see science fiction beginning to turn its back on the attitudes created in the golden era of science fiction, and head steadily forwards to the realisation of what is often perceived as a mainly British new wave. However, the subversive nature of Dune and Stranger in a Strange Land can be viewed as a response to a very general malaise within American science fiction, and in light of their representations to the concerns and ongoing social upheavals of the 1960s, can be regarded as being very much a leading part of an American new wave. The 60s brought about great social upheaval following an era where many had been anaesthetised by the end of World War II. The growing concerns that followed including the dawn of the nuclear age and the beginning of a global awareness towards the damage done to the Earth's environment. The beginning of the environmental movement can be seen as existing in the works of the early ecologists and natural scientists, but its increasing momentum in the awareness of the general public really came in the early 1960s. One work that paved the way for a greater concern of the general public towards environmental problems was Silent Spring, written by the American marine biologist Rachel Carson. The work highlighted concerns of the use of pesticides on the natural environment, looking at their harmful effects on the bird population and ultimately the human population. Of particular notes were Carson's concerns over dichlorodiphenyltrichloroethane, or DDT a by now infamous synthetic pesticide used to combat malaria. Silent Spring's publication is now seen as a fundamental factor in the resulting campaign against the pesticide, which resulted in it being banned in 1972. As much as Silent Spring is a book credited with spurring the dramatic increase in environmental awareness, it is also seen as a book that would help popularise works such as Herbert's Dune, Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land, and Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. All of these books would emerge as college campus favourites in the early 60s and all feature strong environmental and messianic themes. Heinlein's novel brought science fiction into mainstream literary culture for the first time, becoming the first hardback science fiction novel to reach the bestsellers lists. It offered a version of the genre, however, that exaggerated the elements of messianism, right libertarianism and regressive exploration of sexuality that had always been present in Heinlein's writing. Tolkien's fantasy was recontextualised as a counter-industrial, counter-modern allegory, speaking to the ecological consciousness beginning to be articulated by campaigners like Rachel Carson, and which informed the counterculture interest in self-sufficient communalism and environmental politics. Herbert's Dune, still commonly voted the greatest science fiction novel, was received in that context too, with its detailed depiction of the delicately balanced desert ecology of the planet Arrakis, and in an imagined universe where the interplanetary community has actively decided to exclude computer machineries for fear of autonomous cybernetic control. Brian Herbert also sees the impact of Carson's Silent Spring on the awakening environmental movement of the 1960s and Frank Herbert and his ecological ideas. Discussing the layering of Dune as an ecological handbook, he notes the timing of Dune's release, 1963 in magazine format, in relation to events occurring in the United States of America. Environmental awareness was just awakening in the early 1960s, and Frank Herbert was one of the standard bearers. In 1962, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, a monumental work that decried the killing of birds and harmless insects by toxic chemicals such as DDT. In 1963, shortly before the opening instalments of Dune were published by Analog, the first Clean Air Act was passed in the United States. President Kennedy gave a couple of speeches that year 
about protecting the environment. Timothy O'Reilly also notes that the control of nature as discussed by Carson was an important sub-theme in Dune, and the novel that followed The Green Brain. The Green Brain in particular concentrates on this idea with the Carsonites that are mentioned therein, an obvious nod to Rachel Carson's growing influence. The popularity of these works in particular highlights an affinity of science fiction with not just its traditional readership, but also the emerging and diverse counterculture of the 60s. Patrick Parander discusses the shift of science fiction during this period to a more liberal and sometimes more radical position. His suggestion is to examine the works of science fiction which have won both the Hugo and Nebula awards as a good indication of not just popularity of a given work amongst readers, but also amongst writers. This indication, as he points out using Herbert's Dune as an example of the first book to do so, confirmed the existence of an axis between science fiction and alternative culture when it was recommended as an ecological primer in the last Whole Earth catalogue. The 60s also represent a re-emergence of science fiction as a popular form of literature and as a genre that was slowly lifting itself out of the mass of American pulp fiction amongst which it had lain since the early 20s. As Patrick Parander points out, science fiction in the post-1960 period is produced and consumed on a larger scale than ever before, and in looking at American science fiction from the 60s onwards discusses the overall failure of science fiction novels to sell well, noting that between 1965 and 1977 the Dune trilogy seems to be an all-time bestseller. When questioning what it is about the expansion of science fiction into a wider cultural sphere of awareness during this period, he looks at the phenomenon from a cultural angle and suggests that the popularity of hard science fiction comes from an enchantment with technology. However, the malaise of disenchantment has favoured escapist science fantasy and such ecologically concerned bestsellers as Dune. Dune's fame comes more than anything from its ecological awareness and never before seen detail of an entire world transformed by external environmental factors, where every facet of life upon it is perpetually dangerous to those who live there, forcing the Fremen people to integrate the ecology of their world into every single aspect of their daily lives. The level of exactness of Dune's ecological depiction is as much a part of the difficulty that we have in categorising the work. However, those who view Dune as hard science fiction do so because of its ecological message. Those who would view Dune as soft science fiction do so because it combines this rigorous scientific detail with what seemingly appears to be common tropes of fantasy fiction, though I would argue that this is again a misunderstanding of the atavistic society created by the prohibitions of the Butlerian Jihad. Luckhurst states, that the plot of Dune uses all the apparatus of heroic fantasy, while Clarison also takes this view, believing that, despite the science fiction trappings, this is the stuff of heroic fantasy. Peter Stockwell also follows suit in discussing the typologies of utopias present in science fiction, where he takes the view that Dune is an example of an escape to the past, ostensibly set on another planet, but appearing very much like a return to a medieval utopia. This implication here is that because elements of hard science fiction representing one aspect of the author's desire to explore a given theme are combined with another theme which is less focused around science and technology, then the former is cancelled out by the latter. My own point of contention here lies in the fact that Dune may appear to have the trappings of heroic fantasy, primarily because a great deal of fantasy literature contains the trappings of mythology but it is an appearance, which may nonetheless help to continue to generate interest in the series. John Schoenher's artwork also does much to create a fantasy feel for the series, but as it progresses it sheds this appearance in favour of a very futuristic feel, especially in Heretics of Dune and Chapter House Dune. Herbert's Dune is immersed in mythology and this together with the combination of an atavistic society created out of the Butlerian Jihad and the Faufri-like social system embedded in its Imperium, also lend elements to a pseudo-medieval appearance. Thus, for example, we have a world where warriors prefer to fight with knives rather than las guns. Dune still remains grounded in a reality we realise stems from the time of its publication, 
and adheres to the concepts we may understand as being part of what we call science fiction. Although there are elements of mysticism and hocus pocus common to fantasy and horror literature, they are in fact tools of the politically astute used to manipulate and control both individuals and whole communities, separated in a far flung universe by light years of space. The results of how a people are used and manipulated based around the mystical evolutionary dreams of transforming their harsh world is a key presentation of the Dune series' narrative. In this sense, Dune represents environmentalism as part of a religious or mythical ecology. Joan Slonczewski and Michael Levy also follow this viewpoint, though their focus of detraction comes rather from the use of pars in Dune, which are consistent with the superhuman mutations and evolutions more analogous to the Van Vautian heroes which John W. Campbell was championing in Astounding Stories and Analogue magazines. Frank Herbert's Dune portrays living ecosystems in mechanistic detail consistent with contemporary ecological science, yet the same book depicts people with extrasensory powers and memories of past lives that are inconsistent with fundamental science. Adam Roberts presents a lengthy discussion of this ever increasing trend in his analysis of the relationship between magic and technology. He notes that in this trend there is an inherent tendency for hard science fiction to align itself closer to soft science fiction and vice versa. The dialectic between science and magic, or fact and mysticism, or rationalism and religion, actively informs all the major classics of 20th century science fiction. That Metropolis, or Dune, or Star Wars, or Stan Robinson's Mars books, or the Matrix films all articulate precisely this dynamic, and do so for deep reasons connected to the determining history of the genre. In light of that, he goes on to say that Dune is, at the very least, a novel which connects with a particular aspect of the traditions of science fiction anti technological, mystical, and transcendent. Dune then is lauded though not always, for its ecological approach, but criticised for writing on the tales of lesser regarded tropes of science fiction. To say that Dune depicts people with ESP is in one sense quite correct. The abilities of the Bene Gesserit for example coming from their training programme that allows control over one's physical and mental talents. There are various mental abilities portrayed in the Dune series, but they are often depicted as talents acquired from the prescriptions of the Butlerian Jihad, and are more often attributable to observation of minutiae in the languages of human beings, physical and verbal, Herbert's interest in general semantics being the major influence. Elements of hard science and technology that detract from any given understanding of mankind's current technological state at the time of writing are done more for entertaining than any desire to be accurate. Investigating ESP was an interest of Herbert's, and was certainly a subject becoming popular in the 50s and 60s, trying to come under a veneer of respectability by renaming the subject under the heading of parapsychology. ESP is one of my interests to the extent that I have done considerable reading on it in what I would call the quasi scientific end of the field. This includes Rene Sutra's Parapsychology and a considerable amount of J. B. Ryan including The Reach of the Mind and New World of the Mind. I have also dabbled in Puharic, the Sacred Mushroom Writer. I am what you might refer to as an agnostic where ESP is concerned, a doubting Thomas. Some of the writers on this end of the field, such as Fodor and Tassi, are too cookie for my tastes, and I have strong doubts as to the mathematical basis for the statistics of Ryan's tests. Ok, I am from Missouri. This does not, however, limit my enjoyment of a good ESP story, or stay in my imagination in exploring the what-ifs of possible mental powers. Herbert's own desire to not explain every facet of science, technology, politics, or even the raison d'etre for creating such a ridiculously dangerous thing as a quiz at Saderach, are left to the imagination as little mysteries that continue to involve the reader in Herbert's universe long after they have finished reading the books. As he himself said, I refuse, however, to provide further answers to this complex mixture. You find your own solutions, don't look to me as your leader. 
It is perhaps for that reason that Dune is indeed a book that rewards the reader who returns to its pages again and again. However, the portrayal of elements of its story outside of a hard science fiction viewpoint is perhaps one of the features of Herbert's work that allowed it to not descend into an unsolvable maze, giving it just the right amount of complexity to not perplex most readers. Regardless of its attitudes to other elements of science fiction and real life science and technology, ecology is Dune's main thematic approach in relation to human science, and for this it is clearly praised by even the most stalwart of critics and scientists. 